This is Twit. Um, last week, during the recently completed DEF CON cybersecurity conference, several hackers managed to hack into multiple U.S. voting machines, in some cases in as little as a few minutes, some cases taking an hour and a half or so. Um, for the first time ever, but likely not the last, because it was such a success, DEF CON hosted what they called their Voting Machine Village, during which the conference's tech-savvy attendees tried and succeeded hack many commercial voting machine systems and help catch vulnerabilities in them. Um, this year, the first year this was done, but the, the, the planners already intend to make this thing a, a, a regular feature, provided 30 different pieces of voting equipment used in U.S. elections, uh, including the, the Sequoia AVC Edge, the ESNS iVotronic, the AccuVote TSX, the WinVote, uh, and the, uh, is it Diebold? Yeah, Diebold or Diebold? How do you, how do you say that? Diebold. Uh, Express Poll 4000 voting machines. The executive summary is <laughs> that every one of the 30 machines that the hackers poked at were to varying degrees hacked. So not a single one of them resisted attack. Now, in fairness, these weren't hands off, you know, over the air attacks. There were some of those, but in some cases they were, they required you know, f physical access to the machine, but, but, you know, like a USB port or something, the kind, you know, very much like a laptop and, and, and many of the attacks, which we're familiar with that we've talked about over the years work on these machines because, you know, as we know, unfortunately they are internally typically well-known architectures where a screen and some custom software was slapped on top, you know, much like the machines that run the nuclear submarines in the UK. Yeah, well-known architectures like Windows XP <laughs> and Windows <laughs> CE. Yeah, those well-known yeah. architectures. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the DEF CON hackers took complete control of an e-poll book, uh, which is one of the uh, Diebold devices. In fact, I just saw some follow-up news saying that I think it was 650,000 personal information of voters was found on one of those. Wow. Like they and, bought it on eBay and it still had the stuff on it. Yes. Oh, come exactly. on. Jeez Louise. I, I know. this. I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's as worse, it, it, it's as bad as everything we've been covering about IoT yeah. applied to <laughs> voting machines. Yeah. Yes, where we really would rather that they weren't this vulnerable. Right. Um, so that particular e-poll book is currently in use in dozens of states where voters sign in and receive their ballots. So that's not per se a voting machine, but it, it's like a, a, a pre-voting staging device. They also discovered and exploited significant security flaws in the AccuVote TSX, which is currently in use in 19 states, the, the Sequoia AVC Edge used in 13 states, and another hacker broke in to the hardware of another uh, Diebold product, the TSX voting machine. So, although somewhat less surprising, the WinVote voting machine had long been removed from use due to its vulnerabilities. So that wasn't a clear and present danger, but those problems were again confirmed and it was once in wide use while being horribly insecure. Um, they found that a remote access vulnerability in the WinVote OS exposed real election data that was still stored in the machine. And another hacker hacked into the Express poll book system, that's that, that uh, uh, Diebold system, exposing the internal data structure via a known open SSL vulnerability, allowing anyone to carry out remote attacks. So 
So the remote attacks also are possible. These do not recall. These these do not require local physical access. Jake Braun, who is a cybersecurity expert at the University of Chicago, and who convinced DEF CON's founder Jeff Moss on the idea of creating this voting machine village, said, quote, without question, our voting systems are weak and susceptible to attack. He said, thanks to the contributors of the hacker community today, we have uncovered even more about exactly how. Um, there, there will be a more formal report forthcoming. Uh, the, I have a link in the show notes here about the place on GitHub where uh, Joseph L. Hall is assembling the voting village report. Right now, they're, they're just like rough working notes, sort of uh, the output of the various hackers sort of dumping their 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 content out. Um, there will be a formal report. And I did find coverage of this on the Hill uh, website. So, of course, that's D.C.'s uh, one of D.C.'s reporting arms. And that suggests that this is getting the kind of attention that we needed to get. So. That's great. Uh, then another person, Harry Hursty, who's the co-founder of Nordic Innovation Labs, said, uh, and he was also one of the events uh, co-organizers, said that the village was announced at the last minute, but people were active in the forums looking to understand the problems. The changes have to start somewhere, he said. This year, it's in this room. Next year, it will be in a bigger room. So, you know, that's just that's all for the best, as we know. Uh, Eric Hodge, who's the director of consulting at Cyber Scout, a consultant for Kentucky's Board of Elections, said the best possible outcome is that the village results in a book of vulnerabilities to share with the FEC, the states and other firms like ours. I I would take issue with that. Uh, I'll, and I will in a second. Uh, so DEF CON's voting machine village was the first time most researchers had ever had access to voting machines. That's what has to change. OK, so think about that. This was the first time most researchers ever had access to voting machines. This is because they are considered proprietary and their their manufacturers protect them and don't allow anyone to poke at them. Well, every lesson we have learned through the years of this podcast has taught us that that is a strategy that is doomed to failure. That's what has to change. There's no way that any or county government should be allowed to spend taxpayer money on machines which have not been independently audited by security researchers. Rather than treating their machines like proprietary closed boxes, voting machine manufacturers should gleefully turn their machines over to every independent security researcher they can find for the purpose of hardening their security offerings. When purchaser, then purchasers should have candidate uh, purchases again independently vetted by still other independent researchers. In other words, you know, the lessons we keep learning is that, you know, even with the best of intentions, mistakes are made. And right now we're in a completely uncontrolled environment where, you know, the, the manufacturers are boating about boasting about their military grade security and, you know, using unearned reputation Basically, I mean, you know, ev everyone knows Diebold. They're they're a, a well-known company, but they're obviously not able to produce secure voting machines. They shouldn't be purchased without some some reason to believe that they're secure. And of course, I'm reminded of Steve Ballmer's pre-Win XP release, where he was prancing around the stage, screaming into a microphone about how XP was the most totally secure operating system ever created before its release. And as we all know, after shortly after its release, XP was a security disaster. So as I've often said, the security of a system must be designed in, but any actual 
systems delivered security can only be proven afterwards. So, um, I, you know, I'm glad I'm so happy that this was done, that it's gotten a lot of press coverage, that that there's egg on the face, deserved it, deservedly so, because every one of these manufacturers was, of course, claiming impenetrable security and but never being willing to put it to the test. So that was tested. Not a single machine was found to be secure. So, you know, I, 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 after I put this show together, I saw some news about some forthcoming potential IoT legislation. You know, I think that's all for the best. We need something similar for voting machines. Otherwise, everyone's saying, you know, everyone talking about the integrity of our system, it, it's just empty air. Now, that said, there is an advantage to, and I've also often said this, to a heterogeneous environment. That is, we don't want everyone in the country at every state of government using a single machine. That's that's very dangerous. So the so the fact that we have many systems, many companies creating, you know, widely differing machines, that's better. And and we also want to do things like avoid hooking them all together into, into one big network. One of these machines it, was Wi-Fi enabled, which is obviously a terrible idea for a voting yes. machine, right? Yes. I mean, yes. It, you don't even need physical access. Yes. Um, that is said to be the strength of the U.S. Uh, voting system is that every registrar in every county has a choice. And so there is no heterogeneous, there is no homo homogenous system. So that's good. Right. Yeah. yeah. And and again, the, the, the problem that we see big companies purchasing each other or big companies purchasing right. smaller ones and reducing choice and reducing competition, but also reducing heterogeneity right. and – you know that's a strength that 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 we have now. Uh, we need not to we need not to lose that. What you really want is uh, every voting machine needs to have a paper trail, so that in case of concerns you can have an audit. Uh, the problem is electronic voting machines that have no paper trail. Then it, right. then, the, then the machine is the only reliable source or unreliable source of the vote. If you, have right. a, if you have a paper trail for every vote, you can do spot checking, and in the case of tr trouble, you can do a full recount of, on paper. Yeah, and I think, I mean, if, were I architecting these, I would, I would think, I mean, I'm not, you know, not having looked at this closely, it would seem to me that having a machine produce a, you know what a fan I am of paper. You know, a squirrel prints its its secrets on paper because they're offline inherently, and they're you can't attack them by Wi-Fi or a USB dongle. So imagine if the if the machine were just a transcriber of a friendly UI, which then printed out right. a right. a a on paper a you know a barcode summary of exactly what that voter did and then you and then in a separate stage you collect all of those machines spools of paper and feed them through Precisely. a master a master right. tabulator right and then you can do it you know as much as you want so you have several stages of of checkpoint that way i'm going to point you to we did a triangulation on this before the election this year uh, last year, I guess, uh, to verifiedvoting.org, which is a really great uh, organization that talks about all of this. And, of course, they talked about the hacking conference. And there is, um, under under the, um, uh, I'm not sure where it is on here, but there is a proposal for a way to do this that would be highly secure. And it, it solves a lot of these problems. These people have been thinking about this for a long time. And so, uh, you know, uh, this Good. is this. Yeah, this is a this is a solve, frankly, a solved problem by some very smart computer scientists and mathematicians and uh, an, an election folks. But, you know, inertia, inertia yeah. and money, <laughs> yep. frankly, because it costs money to do this. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. And in fact, you know, if if the if in, in my example, if the format 
of the barcode, which was printed out, was was standardized, and it absolutely should be, then then you have a standard point in between the machine that that takes the votes and produces the barcode and on the back end the tabulator that that's that optically you know swing you know uh, uh, ingests all of those uh, in 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 a continuous paper strip and tabulates so you're not you're not reducing competition you're creating a, a, a standard protocol that allows machines on both ends to be independently designed and created and and sold in a competitive marketplace but with a common standard interchange format between the front end and the back end yeah and you trust i would trust caltech and mit and they have something they call the voting technology project that addresses uh, a variety of ways, not just technologies to take votes, but maybe even better ways to vote because, of course, there's other proposals about weighted voting and things like that that uh, are interesting. But this is a good site. It's vote.caltech.edu. Nice.